forward. All right, this is the all IPFS all hands call for May 7th, 2018. And, uh, we're, and I'm the moderator. So if you are attending and haven't added yourself to the hack tag, go ahead and do that now. And uh, we're now recording. And oh, do we have any agenda items? Looks like we have one on the list right now. It might be a very short meeting. So um, DJ DV, uh, Dominic, go ahead with your item. All right, so window, or, um, summer is quick approaching and we do not have mount support on Windows, which is gonna make installing air conditioning quite difficult. Uh, hilarious jokes aside, there is no mount support on Windows, uh, not first party and not even third party. There's two projects that I know of that uh, attempt to have IPFS mountable on Windows, but uh, I haven't had success with them and I check on them about once a year at least. So I just wanted to make a statement of intent saying that this is going to be something I'm going to be focusing on. It's just at least getting feature parity with Unix on this so that we can have a read only, so that we can have read only access to IPFS and IPNS objects uh, through the file system, or at least exposed to the operating system as a file system. Uh, but ideally, I would like to incorporate some of the stuff that um, Alan Shaw has, has done with uh, MFS, where we expose also a writable uh, route to the operating system. So there's not much really to talk about at the moment. I just wanted to make it known that that's something I'm going to be focusing on. So if you're interested in any of that, please uh, reach out to me. And that's basically it. Any questions for Dominic? Is anyone interested in jumping in on helping Dominic? Okay. We'll th oh, How about, Johnny? Yeah, just isn't there um, a Windows? It's a uh, Duncan or Dukin. It's a wrapper for um, Fuse. Yeah. So we there's there's two third party uh, approaches to mounting right now that use Dokken uh, or rather a Dokken fork called Dokeny, which they they get as far as to mount a drive letter, but as soon as you start dealing with bigger data sets, they they hang indefinitely. Um, the one that was just posted in the chat is an alternative to that, WinFSP which is basically our alternative to Fuse on Windows, um, but also wraps Fuse. So it's, uh, these are the kind of th kinds of things I'm gonna be focusing on and, and hopefully we can start a discussion on this where it's like, what, uh, what libraries should we, should we be using for this? What is the feature set we wanna target for this? Should we change functionality on Unix and, and that kind of stuff? But the, the current approach that I'm thinking of is that will likely want to use WinFSP uh, for the Windows side of things and at least get feature parity with Unix. But ideally, we, I'd like to extend out mount um, on both Unix and Windows inside of GoIPFS. Uh, whether or not we should keep that in GoIPFS though or branch that out to a separate repository is another thing we'll have to discuss as well. Mike? Um, I, I just want to say I actually have some experience writing a, a, wind, a Windows Fuse. Um, it, this was an open source project about 10 years ago. It died. Um, Dokken became kind of the de facto like standard. But I, 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 well, I won't waste everyone's time on the call, but just really briefly, Dokken has a bunch of subtle problems that aren't, aren't going to be immediately obvious. Um, just as an example, when Microsoft Office applications open and close files, they do really funky stuff, like they make a copy of the file and then open that, and just, just ex Windows Explorer does weird stuff. So there's a lot of subtleties here. Um, I'm like 10 years out of date, so I'm not sure how helpful I'm gonna be, but uh, Windows probably hasn't changed, the kernel hasn't changed much in 10 years, so um, anyway, if, if, if I can help, I'm happy to, happy to talk offline. Cool, thank you, Mike. Which also means Dominic's not alone. Yeah, it's nice <laughs> to have some Windows support. Finally, <laughs> uh, just a quick, quick comment on that too. Um, WinFSP seems to have been born out of frustration with the fundamental problems of Dokken. So it's pretty immature at, at 
right now, but I'm interested in looking at it and seeing if it's a viable option for us going forward. We could potentially make improvements like um, once you get a, a Windows kernel development environment set up, which is, which is kind of a hassle, um, but but easier with you know v VMs and stuff. Um, you can you know you can do a lot like step through the kernel code, figure out where is it um, deadlocking and stuff. And but it, it's 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 like a serious undertaking. Um, but maybe maybe we should focus on trying to improve Win FSP because Dokken's been it's crappy for like. 10 years or however long it's existed. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to defer this to asynchronous comms, um, but it's nice to have people actually talking about Windows support. <laughs> it's been neglected for a long time. We've been <laughs> like working hard to give it some love. Uh, so live P2P node trust, that's uh, magic. Um, hi, so I have prepared some slides because I've been working on this lib P2P node trust project, maybe some still know it, and now I want to actually, um, uh, wait a minute, I have to select the window to share. Uh, so I have been working on this project Lipid Node Trust, which uh, basically solves the problem of uh, decentralization in the browser. Because currently the LibPLP network is very decentralized, but the browser isn't. So in a normal node, there are the centralized bootstrap nodes, but the node also uses various methods such as MDNS or DHT. The discover PR styles over various transports, TCP, web sockets, and UDP. And this means that there are thousands of nodes that can be dialed, which means that everything is decentralized. Um, but in a the browser, there's this problem that um, besides the bootstrap nodes, there is only a um, PLP circuit which pushes traffic to the bootstrap nodes. And there is WebSocket star, which is the hack that existed before PLP circuit. And then there is also WebRTC star, which uh, seems to um, kill the browser by using too much memory. And then technically web sockets could be used, but uh, that obviously doesn't work on any um, legit website nowadays because every website uses HTTP. And uh, so I thought, why not use WebSocket uh, secure? But uh, that would require certificates. Uh, Zev signed certificates obviously don't work. So I made this tiny DNS hack, which basically um, converts some IP addresses into um, a DNS address that uh, later can be that the certificate can later be issued for. And that basically hacks around all these limitations. And now nodes that run on random machines can acquire a certificate from uh, the LibPLP node trust server for their IP address and the browser can dial them directly from any website and no limitations whatsoever are involved. And the nodes also discover each other over FlatSub, so even if the main node goes down, um, the other nodes in the network will still relay all the FlatSub messages. So the network can still work even if the main node is down. And thus the browser becomes more decentralized. There is also a demo available on libpnotrust.tk slash demo. Um, and the future plans are now basically that um, I want to uh, make this module more robust and secure and maybe finish up tests. And also wanted to get deployed in the P2P infrastructure and maybe make it get used in production. So my main problem has been um, that simply uh, it, look, it looks like um, not so many people care about it. And uh, I just want to raise awareness that this thing still exists and I may need some help in getting it to run in production because obviously I can't deploy it myself and uh, I don't know if the code even is great. So yeah, 
now it's time for some Q&A. Any questions from much or comments? I have a couple of comments and a question. But I don't see if I'll be able to have hands. Yeah, no, go ahead, start. Uh, cool, cool. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation, Nachi. I think this is a really nice way to like capture like the intent of the project, uh, something that we actually needed uh, for a while, uh, as it's it is something very ambitious and very new, uh, and this way we all are on the same page. So thank you for that. Um, the the well, so my question is, um, does this mean that we can dial to any node behind the net or just nodes that are listening on a WebSocket endpoint, uh, but they still need to have a public IP address? They need to have a public IP address or a method of making it public using various methods of not circumvention. Um, have you explored any of the various methods of NAT circumvention? Uh, uh, I think like, I didn't. So uh, I'm I'm asking like if for the cases so, so a lot of the browser nodes uh, will have um, so so I'm like trying to understand if this is just like a quick setup for people that want to deploy JSAPFS nodes uh, on a, a server machine or if this is actually a solution that uh, for any browser node that stands behind or actually for any JSAPFS node that stands behind the net. Uh, that so that it can be dialed from a browser node. Um, this is actually a solution for all kinds of nodes, um, but uh, only obviously the uh, node that does not run in a browser can acquire the certificate. Also, not all methods of NAT circumvention work. Um, I think uh, UPnP should work, but there are also other methods that use uh, some. Uh, methods to uh, confuse the firewall into opening a connection. Um, mm -hmm. I think this was UDP punching or something that, that doesn't work. But it works for mostly all other kinds. As soon as the port is public, it should work. So interesting. Um, one one more question. I still don't see any more hands, so I'll just continue. Um, like in, in the past, there were problems where, for example, CDNs had one certificate that then they created other certificates that depended on the first one to give to uh, different websites. And then when one of those websites were actually hosting some kind of malicious content, some kind of like bad bits that had to be blocked in certain region, then all the other websites got blocked because of that. And so there was for some time a blackout for many, many companies that they didn't realize what was happening. Um, is there, like, have you considered this scenario where someone just uses the fact that like it gets very easy to get the certificate under libp2p.io or some even other domain like libp 2 node trust and, and therefore then uses that certificate to actually do some bad stuff and therefore blocks every single other certificate in certain regions. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really think that true, but uh, I think that might be a problem, but it could also somehow be resolved because there are, for example, also other public domains, for example, com.uk, which is the common prefix of commercial websites in the UK, and that also doesn't get blocked, and that's also just a domain. So I guess it should be possible to somehow arrange that uh, we simply say that we are not responsible for everything that the subdomains do, and somehow pass on the responsibility to the government to block a specific address and not the whole domain. Okay, so basically more room to explore. Yes. Um, Jenny, you have a question? Yeah, it. so it was actually, it's a uh, stem from the Stop Online Piracy Act. And so, and I think Microsoft actually had this too, where actually they, whatever, someone was selling Windows licenses on some d domain and basically, the government actually allowed Win, uh, Microsoft to take over the entire domain and actually reroute. Uh, so, uh, so any any 
potentially malicious activity on, if you want to do what is a P2P or no trust, it's, like the government will actually will, could take down the entire domain. Mm. And given mm. the content that potentially would be going over uh, IPFS or libp2p, I think that would that's uh, one point of failure. I don't see any other way around it, but it's still um, it could be pose a challenge. And also, I think the other my other, my one question is with uh, let's encrypt. Are you proving ownership with just a DNS with a text entry on the DNS domain? Yes, with a TXT challenge. TXT. I have written a custom web uh, DNS server for that that resolves the addresses and also uh, puts in the TXT records if required. Okay. Dominic? Uh, so I was kind of curious about, um, David was saying about someone on the network providing bad bits essentially and, and, and ruining it for everyone. Uh, something that came to my mind was the ability to relay traffic for other nodes. Uh, I know this is something that's not, uh, or that's being explored right now and I was wondering if you had considered um, the interactions with stuff like that. Like if I make myself a relay and allow someone to use me as a, as a point to relay their content, would that uh, expose me to I guess any bad behavior, like uh, I, I would essentially be an open proxy for someone's malicious activity, and I'm guessing that that would impact my node negatively. Is that something you had considered? Um, I think that is something that's actually part of peer-to-peer -peer circuit because the peer-to-peer -peer node trust itself does not do any relaying at all. It just provides a web socket secure connection, but I think it's uh, something that should be considered. Uh, in terms of the circuits, the, at least in that case, the inside the encryption from end to end is actually encrypted through the circuit. Uh, so the node that's sitting in between the proxy won't actually be able to see the, the data. That could all the node at the endpoint actually identifies itself to the, the other side. So it's not it's not quite like Tor, um, but yes, it, it may be an issue. But it's not like you're actually seeing the bits and actually like passing the bits through like in clear text. You're basically just like passing like uh, encrypted bits through that you can't see. Gotcha. So where can we redirect this discussion to so it can continue? Like this is a dense, rich topic that has lots mm. of uh, Yes, I can put the link to the uh, repository in the notes. All right. Thank you for thank you for that. And then Mike and David, do you have any suggestions about how to, like, how this conversation can continue, or just leave it with? Uh, I I think as uh, always, like it's always best good to have uh, an issue um, like on the we P2P project to keep discussing it, just like to keep a track of it. Um, we can also just like use that issue to point to the we P2P no trust repo, and then continue there. Um, great. All right. Thank you. Much this is this presentation was great. It makes it so much clearer of like what you're working on and why you're working on it and what the implications are. So that's wonderful. Thank you. I just made the presentation in 30 minutes. Well, it was well done. It's worth the 30 minutes, I'd say. Um, next item is me. Uh, it's more of a just a reminder the IPFS summit planning is coming along. Is anyone interested in being involved in the planning for the summit? Okay, Jay is expressing interest. Anyone else interested? Okay, so oh, all right, Kyle. All right, and so if you're interested, contact me, and we'll as we start spinning things up, we'll we'll start figuring out how people can help us make this happen. And. Uh, in the meantime, Mike and I are doing a bunch of the work. David's doing a bunch of the work. Um, yeah, we'll be putting it together. Johnny, were you? Is that a question, or you want to help? Um, uh, I'm willing to help. I'm actually. I'll be in Berlin the week before, oh. <laughs> um, in the last week of June, and uh, so are we, are we set. Are we hard hard on the dates? We are not fully, fully committed, but we are very, pretty firm on shooting for June, July 10th through 13th. Okay. So 
Uh, it depends on, at this point, on whether we get the hotel blocks and the venue, but we'll see. Power source. Uh, <clears throat> so it would be in Berlin or there yes. or here? So the IPFS, yeah, so the Reblue weren't on last week's. The, we're, we're doing two events this year. The IPFS Summit, which will be in July in Berlin, is a smaller meeting that's for people who are actively involved in contributing on IPFS or LibP2P or IPLD. Uh, so it's like people who are existing contribu contributors or very active adopters. Um, and then uh, in November in Lisbon, we'll be doing the IPFS conference, which will be a bigger event that's open invitation or open registration. Anyone can come and it'll be uh, less. It's where the one in July in Berlin is going to be like a working meeting. Um, so very heads down, get work done, show up with a lot of context already. So, um, so that's like the distinction between the two. But they'll both be in Europe, one in July, one in, in November. All right, anyone else on that? I don't see, now we have multiple screens, so I'm checking for hands. Okay, and then I'll follow up with the people who raised their hands. All right, next item. Uh, yeah, so RFCs, I'm gonna be prodding the, the working group captains again to review the RFCs that are open. We need to get those merged in order to be able to have the working groups have meetings at the summit because technically we didn't have working groups don't officially exist. <laughs> they, they're just like a placeholder that we've been using until we actually formally form those working groups. Um, and then uh, I wanted to flag this thing of making decisions. So like there, there's lots of work happening in parallel right now. And I'm not sure that everyone I'm not sure that everyone is catching all the decisions that are happening. So for example, Rob last week, uh, on last week's All Hands announced that he had an issue that had been open for a while proposing how we handle the like dozens of deprecated GitHub repositories in the IPFS org. Um, that issue has been open for a long time. He gave a final like announcement last week saying, okay, if nobody chimes in, then we're gonna go ahead with the proposal in that issue um, and so now in theory we're just moving ahead but I I'm still not 100% confident that everyone who has an opinion about this actually paid attention or knew about it so does anyone have any thoughts on how like what is the right process we can put into place so that we can be confident that people who care about something know that they have an opportunity to chime in and actually chime in in time. David? Um, I, I don't have the right answer, but I have a couple of thoughts. And because we also have some kind, like some questions that feel very similar in JSLand, typically they are more about like uh, code guidelines and like uh, best practices and, or even like APIs, like how we structure APIs and how we use our docs, which typically are things that are not tracked by people's objectives and key results. And typically are questions that require like a lot of people's attention to actually page in and understand what is being asked and what is the timeline to take such a decision and their, their implications. And so to make sure that like we actually have an opportunity to check in with each other when one of those questions appears, we typically tag those issues, those those asks, those proposals with exploration, like an exploration label. Um, and once per quarter, it's when we actually go through all of those issues and like schedule some time to discuss those and then try to make some decisions over them like try to use that focus time to actually review them and make some decisions and then uh what whatever it's left it's left for the next quarter discussion or whatever appears during the quarter is put, put on hold till next quarter of course like this doesn't work for all kinds of issues because some of them are very urgent like they need to be uh done uh, in a one two weeks maybe a four weeks time 
And, but for all the other ones that are less urgent, for example, deprecating repos could be a good example. I think it's uh, plausible to say, okay, here's a proposal. Um, like no one is necessarily allocating time to page in on what this means. Let's make sure that like when we plan for next quarter, when we have those retrospectives, when we have those sessions, we also allocate one to review this issue and many others that are out there hanging around. This is like what we've been doing. I'm not saying that this is like the right solution for every single project, but um, well, uh, this is the approach we took for, for these kind of questions. Have you given any thought to which of those issues would actually make sense as an RFC and should actually, that we could use the RFC process as a way of flagging things that are a request for comments that will then either be accepted or not? Uh, we, we started these issues before RFC was a thing, but yeah, like I, I guess like what you are saying is correct. Like these should go now through an RFC rather than just like an issue with a proposal and a discussion. But still, I think it still applies, right? Like even with the RFC, it would be good to try to schedule all of these like full reviews and decisions to uh, one point in time rather than uh, like being unsure when people are actually paying attention or not. Uh, like my experience and what I've observed is like everyone is just like super heads down with their key results, mm -hmm. making it really hard for people to like shift into a new context entirely. Yeah. Okay, Dominic. Uh, I was just curious here for things like this that really require the attention of either multiple people or the team as a whole entity. It seems like the main point where everyone converges is email where it's like we have these meetings which are optional, you can hang out in the IRC or not. Um, it seems like the thing everyone convenes on is email. And we already have team stuff set up where you can just message the list and get that announced to everyone on it. And I think things like this, that seems like an appropriate use of that where it's like if you need um, decisions from multiple people to say like, should this repo get axed or not? Um, you know, I need a decision this week maybe that's the place we should be doing that stuff. I'm not sure. All right. That's a, it, keep in mind that a comment on a GitHub issue also shows up as an email. And so, so the people who are only watching their emails can still also get those discussions. I'm more, my question is more about what are the things we can do to signal. This is an important decision that needs to be made by X time. And so pay attention if you have an opinion because after x date the decision has already been made and your lack of chiming in is a statement and like that's not always true with all emails and it's not always true with all github issue comments right so how do we how do we signal this is a special conversation that people should pay extra attention to maybe that we should be putting more through more things through our mm. I, I agree with that. Um, I guess the only thing for me is that in my personal inbox is that those things are very obviously separated. I know a lot of people here probably have filters applied for their GitHub issues and things like that where maybe that gets missed. Um, alternatively though, maybe we could exploit that and maybe have some kind of you know, special word or something like that that gets picked up by a filter and gets, we, we just really make sure that this is something you should see. But Honestly, I'm not sure about it. Cool. Yeah, we should keep, we'll keep that in mind. So the, the email should go out, some sort of email should go out about these things and they should have some sort of special term to, to flag this, like action required or RFC. And well, all right. So thank you, thank you for chiming in on that. Did anyone else have final things or we'll go to the next one? All right. Um, Oh, so this, the confusion that because this bot has been broken for months and is not generating the hack pads for us, um, if we use a Google document, we can just have one Google document that the, that the calendar links to. We just put it into the calendar invite. It's always the same document and we just, we just put the notes up like this. So it just accumulate notes in a longer and longer document. Um, I guess technically we could do that with a hackpad also. It's just I think Hack, HackMD gets a little bit um, wonky when documents get really long. But what are people's thoughts on this? I also noticed last week that when we were using a Google document, people added more things to the, the agenda 
people were more active about adding to the notes or correcting the notes. So there was something beneficial on the UX side that was getting people more engaged with the stuff in that document, which I enjoyed. Um, does anyone else have ob observations or inclinations? Mike? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm a big supporter of the model where you just have an, a, a running agenda Google Doc in the, in the invite. Um, I've, ob I've observed the same thing as you, that people seem more um, willing to just jump in and edit because they, you know, they obviously create a really easy editing interface. I do recognize the drawback that uh, it doesn't produce markdown. It produces uh, data in a completely proprietary Google-owned format. Um, but even in spite of that, I, um, I've seen teams work, work really well under that model. All right. Anyone else? thoughts on this there were some plus ones in the chat for this it's too bad Lars was here and he went away he he might have an opinion oh there I'm here yeah <laughs> you have, uh, you, any um oh the only thing I'd um I'd like to make sure is that we still um commit notes to the repo um so that they don't get locked in, in some cloud and um and to find some way to, to deal with the markdown um I took the notes last uh, last weekend in the Google Docs, and then afterwards I went through them and converted them to to Markdown. And I think there was, there's a plugin or extension for Google Docs somewhere that does it. Um, yeah, I've I've actually I've used that plugin. Um, <clears throat> honestly, it's not perfect, but it it will take your Google Doc and export it into Markdown. Um, and we could potentially even script that so that it's just like every week we're just scraping the Google Doc. So yeah, it's an option. Yeah. Great. Um, so in the chat, Dimitri is expressing some misgivings. Do I, should I open a GitHub issue for discussing this or should we just go ahead with trying the Google Docs and then change if it doesn't work? Does anyone feel like this needs to be like go through the whole like open an issue, discuss it, finalize the decision? I mean, the thing we do right now is broken anyway, um, so. Okay, then I'll set up the Google document. It's there somewhere. I'll just, we'll add it to the calendar and we'll, starting next week, we'll use that. Uh, all right, so that was mine. David has an announcement. All right, yeah, um, just a quick announcement. Uh, since we, we completed the update to the JavaScript code guidelines and we that included the lean maintainers protocol, we started uh, like we started the, the protocol last week and we started assigning lean maintainers. Uh, you can check the, the link that I put here on the notes to see the full table, like including uh, all the modules that are part of the JS ecosystem total of 70 and right now I'm really happy to say that like 41 of those 70 modules have a new assigned lead maintainer, someone that is going to be um, available, ready, uh, paying attention, replying to issues, merging pull requests, doing the NPM publishes uh, of those modules. For the remaining, I'll act as the interim lead maintainer or just lead maintainer, um, but but yeah. So you should see um, a lot of more progress happening on JSLine as more people have now the power and responsibility, the ownership for more pieces of the project. If you're interested in learning more about what does this mean, like again, if you check the JS code guidelines markdown document on IPFS community, it's fully described there, um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone that stepped up to become a lead maintainer of one of the modules of JSAPFS. It's super great to share the responsibility uh, and ownership with you. And, and I, I'm really happy. Like, I couldn't be more happy. <laughs> Thank you for doing all that work to be. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, it, that looks like we've hit all of the agenda items. I added welcome new people because there's a couple couple names or faces I don't recognize. So if you're new and you've never had a chance to introduce yourself on this call before, if you'd like to, um, uh, if you'd like raise your hand or, or say on the chat whether you'd like to say hello, um, just give me a chance for people to jump in, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Okay, I don't see anyone jumping in. All right, well then, uh, thank you everyone. 
uh, for a good call. And we're at the, we're below the 45 minute mark. So, so our new <laughs> 45 minute length, the compromise length, we hit it. And then there is another call after this one. Is that right? The, there's the JavaScript call is after this one. Is that right to be? Okay. So some of you will, will be hopping on another call in 15 minutes. So thank you very much. And you guys have a, have a great week. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.